I think this might be part of your new book, but is it something that you talked about in terms of getting self-absorbed in Hollywood? What is that? What does it look like, first <sighs> off, so we can define it? Well, I think it being self-absorbed looks pretty much the same in every town and country across the globe. You know, it's you. I see it in other people often um, when they just don't. You know, you know. Sometimes you're walking down the street and someone goes, "Hi," and you're abstract, you're you're absent-minded or thinking about something else, and you respond, "Just fine." <laughs> no, that isn't what they said, but you didn't hear that, you know, right. you, you were in your own head. And there are a lot of people um, uh, in this town, but everywhere, that are in their own heads, and they don't, they don't ever ask about you. They never, they, and they're not good uh, ball players, you know, I mean, a conversation, you pass the ball, and if you don't pass the ball, then you're having a monologue, and that's not really that interesting to people. And um, that's what it looks like to me. There's, a, there's this one actress that I encounter all the time. She absolutely knows who I am. But every time she meets me, it's the first time. Oh. And um, we have gone up a, against <laughs> each other for, for roles, and, and I've gotten some of them, and she's gotten some of them. But there is... A, I think a lot of the people who are the most self-absorbed are also those who are the most threatened, Ooh. who um, who feel that if they are not focused on themselves and what it is they need and what it is they want and what it is that perhaps you can deliver to them, um, uh, then they're not taking care of business. You know, they have to be. You know, it's all about the next thing, and. Um, and that sort of reminds me of the of this man that I when I first got my first television show, I was going to celebrate, and I took myself out to a place called Joe Allen's. It's called something else now, and it's quite a popular place, but I don't remember. And my father was an actor, and I my parents divorced when I was very young, and he was a fantastic actor. And I think that I gravitate, although I've written and acted since I could write or speak, um, I think I pursued acting in a way to kind of bring my father closer to me, at least metaphysically, psychologically. And so he was the first one I called. My mother had supported me my whole life, but he, my father was the first one I wanted to call and say that I got my first job in TV. So I went to this bar and called him from a payphone. Do you remember what those are, any of you out there? <laughs> um, and, he, uh, and I told him about it, and he was not that excited for me. <laughs> Because he was a little jealous himself, yeah. because he was self-absorbed, you know. And, in, and instead of being joyful for his daughter, even though he was my father and we wouldn't ever go up for the same parts, I had landed something that was really good. And he couldn't really support me in that, yeah. you know. He was, and I, my spirit really felt a wound. I, I played it off because, you know, that's how I roll. Sure, but sure. I, but I, but it hurt me. And, but I said, all right, he is, but the, I shook it right off and I said, he is not going to crunch my buzz. I'm going to carry on with this celebration. So I went to the bar and I bought myself a cocktail and um, I was chatting with the bartender and then a man came in and uh, he's, and I struck up a conversation and, um, and I was facing him and he was facing the door and, and, and he was, you know, he was talking to me. But, but, I, but I could see that he was always looking at the door. He was always waiting. If every time the door opened, somebody came. Because he was, you know, I was nobody. I was just some girl at the bar, you know. And, um, and he was waiting for somebody more important than I or someone who could do something for him. I, could, yeah. I watched it. I watched his face as he was, you know, it was, I, I was just a time, I was a space holder. Sure, sure. And, and sure enough, somebody came in and that, that he knew or that he started to chat up that was, and he, and he dropped me as though he had never seen me before in his life. He didn't even say, lovely talking with you, my pal's here. Nothing like that. Yeah. He just, and I watched him like a scientist because I could see it happening. Maybe it was my father's recent sort of lack of enthusiasm for my job. Um, but that got me primed for this. But I watched this guy, as I said, like a like a scientist, and and I thought the casual yeah. rudeness and disregard that I saw and still see uh, 
in this town uh, is uh, really, it was no longer surprising, but it is remarkable. It is worthy of remarking on, you know, because it, it, ha it has nothing to do with you or me or whoever is the one who is the recipient of the rudeness. It says everything about the person who hasn't any social grace or any, uh, you know, experience in, in sharing life. I think there's almost like this acceptable level of that here, which unfortunately well it, it shouldn't be. But I think, yeah, it, it can be a, where they kind of people need to size you up. What can you? Okay, this person can't do anything for me. Then moving I'm, on. I'm moving on. Right. Um, but I want to go back to the parent thing. Only that I've seen two types of performers here, and those are people that have, and I wouldn't call them stage parents, but parents that just follow everything they do and they're the biggest supporters of them and then I've seen the exact opposite. I don't usually see a lot of gray area of right. those that, oh that's nice dear, okay, and they change the subject. Right. And I, I think it's interesting that you were there to take care of yourself to celebrate for you. Um, what, what would you say to people that don't have the parent that's the cheerleader? Get your tribe, find mm. your people, make your family and stick with them and support them and, and, and let them support you. And take care of yourself. Make sure that you support you. Right. You know, it's you, because the, very rarely are members of the same family conceived or born under the same roof. You know, haven't you noticed that you've collected family, uh, you're chosen, your friends are the family that you choose. And, um, and so it's, it's nice. I know everybody wants their parents' approval. That's really important. I mean, you can see all kinds of psychological damage done to children who are now grown adults who are still striving for the love of their parent or the approval of their father or their mother or something like that. It's a struggle. But, you know, uh, you, you be there for you. And, and allow yourself to celebrate. Other people don't have to celebrate you. You can celebrate yourself. And it's not big-headed or anything. It's let the universe know, thank you. Something good has happened. This is terrific. And, and even if you're celebrating it by yourself, however you celebrate it, you know, with a taco and a horchata or a glass of champagne or <laughs> meeting somebody and let's go to the movies or let's go for a walk on the beach or fly a kite or whatever. But do it, because we let all of these moments go by, all of these celebratory moments that, that, and then we think we've just been living this kind of life, when we could have been living this kind of life, and this kind of life, and this kind of life, but then, the, you know, the, we have to acknowledge the moments. If you don't acknowledge it, it's, I think it's like with any relationship, a human relationship, you know? If someone does something for you, and you acknowledge it, it increases by many fold the likelihood that they will do another nice thing for you. So if the universe is doing nice things for you and you go, meh, hmm, don't hurt the universe's feelings for goodness sake. You know, you, you, you need to acknowledge. It encourages, it, it, it stimulates the flow of more good things to celebrate. Yeah, I feel like people don't do that until a major upset or death happens. And I don't mean Often. to get so morbid, but it's no, true. No, I know what you I mean. Think. It's those, those moments in life that call everything into question. Oh, my God. You know, I, I, now I look around. All these deaths that we've had in the last year of all these musicians who are in their like late 50s or 60 years old or something, yeah. way too young to go. I can remember when I was 14, my boyfriend and I and his mother drove down to, to uh, Connecticut to see his grandfather. And uh, they were sitting around the table and, they, and my boyfriend asked about, how's Mr. Smith down the road? And he said, oh, he died. Only 70. Such a young man. And up until that moment, I had never thought of life or, or age as relative. I thought of it as you know, whatever the opposite of relative is, that, you know, that, you know, I'm 14, 70, that's a million years old. <laughs> but suddenly I saw this man, who was himself only 69 or something, look at 70 as being young. And then I realized, oh my gosh, it is. It's, it, it, why are we waiting 
to realize that life is worth living right now. You know, why do we need Mr. Smith down the road to die at the very young age of 70? For us to start thinking about the days that we have. Because you know what? And this is not morbid. This is just the truth. No one knows. No one knows. That's true. When, when their time has come. You know? So if you keep waiting to, to have your adventures or to celebrate or... Oh, I have a really fun one to share with you. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, okay.